Hello there. Welcome to another exciting edition of Community Report on Channels Television. I'm Victoria Ido. On this episode of the show, we're turning our attention to dietitians and nutritionists. Have you ever thought about what type of meal to eat, when to eat, and how to eat? Well, let's ask the nutritionist on the show today. Welcome. The physical substance of a human body is made up of living cells and extracircular materials and is organized into tissues, organs and systems. These materials are what makes the body function properly. A lot of factors play a role in staying healthy. In turn, a good health can decrease the risk of developing certain conditions. These include heart disease, strokes, some cancers and injuries. One part of a healthy lifestyle is eating right or eating healthy, getting regular exercises, lose weight if overweight, protect your skin, avoid smoking or the use of tobacco, limits the use of alcohol you consume, and many more. What we eat is closely linked to our health. A balanced nutrition has many benefits. By making healthier food choices, one can prevent or treat some kind of conditions or illnesses. Knowing how to eat healthy is the work carried out by dietitians and nutritionists. Nutritionists generate and deliver evidence-based advice to improve health and well-being and also promote a healthy diet and lifestyle. While a dietitian applies the science of nutrition to the feeding and education of groups of people and diseases. There's actually no much difference between what I do and what a nutritionist do. A nutritionist can actually do my work. I can do the work of a nutritionist. The only thin line between the two of us is that I've had clinical experience, and maybe that nutritionist has not had clinical experience. So there might just be some cases which the nutritionist might not be able to handle because they've not had on-hand experience with that case. There might just be some cases. But apart from that, there's actually no difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian. The little line is just the fact that I went for a one-year internship and maybe the nutritionist didn't go for that. Their role usually stems from identifying nutritional problems and preferring solutions to it. My role majorly is to identify nutritional problems and after identifying nutritional problems, I assess the nutritional problems and I prefer um, solutions to it. There are actually indicators, there are markers to check if there are nutritional problems with someone, especially for children. If I'd say for children, you can either check for the color of the hair. Yeah, the color of the hair. If the hair is discolored, maybe it's brownish instead of black, and the texture of the hair, if it's sparse, and uh, the shape of the face, the shape of the abdomen, the shape of the legs. So those things are indicators to check if someone is actually um, not nutritional healthy. And if one out that, you can also check the person. You can check maybe the person's weight, the person's height, height for the weight if it's not co um, correlating, and other indicators also. Those things you can do. The misconception that a person only needs a dietitian when he or she might have been sick is fallacious. You don't really need to be sick to meet a dietitian. Um, dietetics, um, nutrition and dietetics is actually both a preventive and curative kind of profession. So it helps you to prevent nutritional illnesses and it could also help you to cure them. So you don't need to be sick to meet a dietitian. There's a saying that says you are what you eat. Yeah, so when you meet a dietitian, the dietitian tells you what to eat. It's just simple, what to eat to prevent or what to eat to cure if there's a disease to cure. To become a dietitian, a university degree is required and with that degree, the sky is the limit. I actually picked medicine and surgery, and I, go, I found myself doing this. In the first year, it was actually funny, because the, the course was, I was not gelling with the course, if I could use that English. It wasn't gelling at all. Like, what concerns me concerns food and nutrition. And I was actually thinking it was going to be about cooking and all those things. But when I went for my IT, my just start training, I actually got to know that, okay, it's beyond that. You get to see patients, you get to work with doctors, you get to work with other physicians, nurses and all. So from there, I started telling myself, okay, yes, I actually want to be a clinical dietitian. So after that, I got out of university and I'm here now. The saying that you're what you eat indicates that the state of your health is a byproduct of what goes into your body. Before going, there, going to that place, I'd say, like we already agreed that we are what we eat, the, the actual meaning of that is that your body contains every nutrient it is that you eat from the food in a particular amount. 
your body has fat in it the fat is there to help you cushion your egg organs your body has carbohydrate it has fat it has proteins it has minerals and everything it's stored in your body there already so you just need to add more for it to be sufficient most times now when you add more than you're supposed to take in that there's a problem so for you to prevent it you need to know the actual amount that is why it's called an adequate diet you need to know the actual amount that is supposed to go into your body so that there will be a balance between what is coming into your body and what has been there before so with that, we knowing the actual amount that comes in, you can actually prevent diseases. Seeing undernourished children can connote malnutrition, but in the real sense of it, it's more than that. No, no, no that's, that's not all that leads to malnutrition. Malnutrition is uh, it's, it, the, the two edges, so if I can say, it's either undernutrition or overnutrition. The undernutrition is actually seen more, like what you said, people disturbing children in war, um, war zones or any other thing. Now the overnutrition is where um, obesity comes in. So it's either undernutrition, you've taken lesser than what you're supposed to take, and it's not sufficient to your body. Then overnutrition is when you've taken more than you're, what you're supposed to take. So your intake is, your intake is more than your outtake. So malnutrition is two, either undernutrition or overnutrition. How then do we avoid malnutrition? How to avoid uh, malnutrition? You need to know your markers, your vitals. When I mean by vitals, you need to know, you need to be aware every time of your BP levels, you need to be aware of your blood sugar levels, you need to be aware of your pulse rate sometimes, you need to be aware of your weight, you need to be aware of your height. It's just like um, going to the hospital to check your blood group and your genotype, and also going to the hospital to check your HIV status. Those things are important. These vitals also are important. So when you know your, your weight, your height, your BMI, your other indicators, when you know them, then you should now know also that, okay, this is what I'm supposed to take per day, and this is what I'm not supposed to take per day, because everything actually boils down to moderation. Everything you eat has to be modified. It has to be moderated. That is how you know. Proper nutrition is when all classes of food are ably represented in a meal. If from what you said, rice in the morning, a bar in the afternoon, right? And beans in the night, well, that's actually not eating bad if it's adequately enough. Why, what I mean by if it's adequate enough is nutrition comes to play when every nutrient is in adequate amount. An adequate diet will look like this. Hmm. The best meal plan, there's actually no best meal plan because one size doesn't fit all. It's, it's an individualized something. Like I said before, an adequate diet comprises of all possible nutrients contain the food so your, your carbohydrates has to be there in the adequate amount your protein has to be there in the adequate amount you have to balance everything so rice maybe fish maybe your vegetables or your salad with beans or something then maybe you can take a glass of milk or yogurt that is actually how it, the adequate diet should be but some people <laughs> some people go some people go actually go beyond that and just do what they want to a person gains weight when the amount of calories consumed are more than the calories expelled um, uh, your body is almost like a system, garbage in, garbage out. So if you take more nutrients, no calories than you are, you are expending in a day, then that what gets you to be fat. Most times, most times, maybe 60% or 70% of the time, there are conditions called PCOS, where no matter what, no matter how small what you eat, you, what is, you will still continue to be fat because there is no hormonal balance, there's an hormonal imbalance. So apart from PCOS, there's also an, uh, a condition called lipedema. Lipedema is a distribution of fat at the lower abdomen, especially for women. So you see that somebody might be thin from here up, but from here down, the person is excessively fat. So that one you can't see is because the person is actually taking uh, more of calories. That is because there's an imbalance in the way her fat distribution is placed. Children under the ages of five usually find it difficult to eat Ungozi Olua to be a pediatric nutritionist tells us how we can make them eat what they naturally would not want to eat. You know, you know beans can actually be like uh, you can grind it and give them akara or moi moi. You first observe if I give him beans or give her beans, does she take it? You know, because they are new to this food, sometimes they might reject it at first. The parents might get discouraged and they'll be like, ah, oh, my child does not like to eat beans. But you have to try again. And trying again, you have to use maybe a different plate, colored plate, colored spoon. Maybe you can shape the beans into a love shape. Different ways just to make them, make it attractive. Children we know are very picky with food. Getting them to eat may require a lot of observation. 
there's no best healthy diet because um, sometimes children might react to this food and not react to this. So it's to observe what that child loves and give it to him or her. Now, maybe you're in a situation where you can't always give that child that. Um, you now have to work with making it tasty, fun, and you know, so that they can eat it. Maybe this child doesn't like um, a ban soup. And most times you cook a ban soup. So how do you now work with a ban soup? The soup, maybe you now, we have different, like afang is green. And you tell the child, okay, if you take this green um, soup, you'll be strong. And you know, this is vegetables. You'll be strong and healthy. You want to be like this person, just take it. Now, you can also, <laughs> it's quite funny, but you know the way they, um, in hotels, they package this uh, and all these swallows. You can make it look appealing too. Basically, children need all classes of food for growth and development. That's why it's important to find creative ways to give them every class of food. I think they need basically everything. They don't need this, no. They need carbohydrates, they need proteins, they need um, minerals and vitamins, they need fats, they need water. So everything is important. Um, what you just have to do is um, know how to balance it, an adequate diet. Child obesity may not become a major issue until physical activities have drastically been affected. Shortness of breath, um, sleep, probably sleeping disorder, uh, overeating, when the child is always overeating. You know, he's wanting to eat and be satisfied. And another thing to eat and keep eating. Like this child is never tired of eating. So um, sometimes pot belly too. As a parent, if you notice that this child is beginning to have shortness of breath, the child is becoming overweight, the child is having probably, well, you now have to seek a dietitian or a nutritionist. Like, I focus, I'm a pediatric nutritionist. We come in to help understand, okay, why is this child doing this? Because sometimes, um, maybe the child might be stressed, sometimes the child might be reacting to a lot of things. So you now have to understand why the child is doing this in a way to control it. Obesity, if not checked early, can affect a child's development in more ways than one. Some health conditions would require special diet, and clinical nutritionists who specialize in cancer care tells us more. Basically, what we do is when we identify women who have either breast cancer or cervical cancer, we try to help them through the healing process to um, through their diets basically recommending diets that would aid healing for example if a woman with breast cancer has a mastectomy that's removal of the breast she's going to need a diet that will help you know aid healing process aid fast healing process that is the diet that contains more of protein because protein helps to repair tissues and helps to in healing processes. So, and also we need them to have um, adequate carbohydrates for energy. So yeah, that was the. Becoming a cancer care nutritionist requires the understanding of the needs of people with cancer. I had to be in the university for four years to study nutrition and dietetics to get my BSc in Nutrition and Dietetics. So from there, we, I did my service um, and then internship. So before you can be a registered dietitian, you have to have your internship done and get your certificate to be registered, to be able to practice. Yeah, so and how I got into the cancer care aspect of nutrition. So, um, Basically, I worked with the organization, it's an NGO, Optimal Cancer Care Foundation. I worked with them during my 
NYSC. It was just um, fortunate for me, you know, to be able to stay and continue my work there as the in-house nutritionist. And also I do some other small clinical work for them. Sugar, which is generally not good for anyone, is worse than cancer patients. Well, sugar is not really good for everybody, yes. Sugar is generally not good in too much quantity because sugar can predispose you to other underlying diseases like diabetes. And you can't want to have diabetes and have cancer at the same time. That's just a very tricky situation. So to manage somebody like that can be hard. So that's why it's, it's easier for you to um, reduce your intake of sugar, reduce it to the barest minimum, or you know, you have to track your sugar intake. A person's health status will determine the type of diet he takes. If somebody has cancer and is taking a um, meals with more protein, it helps to it helps to kind of fight against the cancer cells and also help to um, develop more tissues and, and also carbohydrate helps to um, increase the energy levels of because if somebody has cancer, the person is sick. Perception, they say, is stronger than reality. And the perception most people have about nutrition is not what nutritionists they're happy with. Nigerians are just starting to accept us into the clinical environment. Um, for example, doctors have always taken our space in helping patients, you know, um, helping them nutritionally. So most of the time when you go to hospitals, they don't have a dietitian or a nutritionist available. Usually just, just the doctor. When a person does not eat right, it certainly will cause certain illness. Eating right is very important because um, your body needs to be able to have, for example, um, the adequate nutrients that you need. It can be in excess and it can be too little. So when you eat right, when you have a balanced diet, your physical activity will be great, your energy level will be great, you'll be able to do your everyday work without getting too tired, too fatigued, and also you feel healthy because everybody knows when they feel at their optimum, optimum best, when you feel like, oh, I feel great today, and your skin is going to look flawless too. Everyone generally needs a nutritionist to guide them. What my role is, is basically promoting wellness and good nutrition. So a lot of people who come to me have been diagnosed with one chronic ailment or the other, ranging from diabetes to hypertension to dyslipidemia, and they need diet plans, lifestyle modifications to manage so that they don't necessarily have to continue to be on medication for the rest of their life. So I promote wellness, good nutrition, and an overall good perspective. And a healthy nutrition equals a healthy weight. So there is the first thing. What is your weight at the moment? There's something called the weight for height. Like for every height there is, there's an ideal weight or a proportional weight to it. So. If we check that and see that where your ideal weight is, is far from where you should be, we now check out a difference and give a plus or minus five difference as well, just to accommodate you as best as we can. So for instance, if your ideal weight is somewhere around, let's say 70 kg, and you're all the way at 90, so we say, okay, we want you to drop to 75. So what is the difference between 90 and 75? That's 15. Now, you need to lose 15 kg. How long do you think you, as an individual, can take to lose 15 kg? Do you want to lose it in a space of five months? Do you want to lose it over a year? It's dependent on you and the work that you can put in, how much time you have to put in. So when you agree with your dietitian or your nutritionist on the time frame, you now divide it by the number of months that you have chosen, and then we now proceed to work on your psyche. Because in everything that we do, the mind has to be in it. If you're not 
psyched to lose the weight. There's no magic that's going to happen. A person will start thinking of losing weight when they start to find it difficult or tiring to do the things they normally will do. By the time you start feeling like you're slow and sluggish in your daily activities, you feel like you no longer do a lot of things with ease, you used to run up the stairs, or used to be a very sporty kind of person, you just feel a certain load on yourself. You need, at that point, you need to actually see a medical professional and ask, I feel this type of way and having this kind of symptoms, can you point me in the, the right direction? Is something wrong with me? At that point, when you see a general physician, it is imperative for the general physician to refer you to see a nutritionist or a dietitian for weight loss. The role of dietitians or nutritionists have not been accepted fully, which is why they face some of the challenges they go through. What has happened is that we've had an influx of people go to medicine and less people go to other specializations like dietetics. So until we have more people in dietetics, until we have peop more people who are ready to speak up against this kind of problems where you have doctors trying to you know, overshadow you and give advice in your, in your place, we're still going to have the problem. But I believe that I'm one voice and my voice is loud enough to be heard. While too much salt may not be good for the body, some diseases are caused by too much sugar. Excess sugar would mean that you're either one, you don't have the, you don't have insulin available in your body for absorption, or your insulin levels are way too low for your body to absorb. So there's type one and there's type two diabetes. So when that happens, a lot of bodily functions are messed up. Forgive my lack of a better word. Um, excess blood, blood sugar paves the way for diabetes because you get to the elevated stage, you get to the pre-diabetic stage, and then you get to the diabetic stage. Now, this only happens if you're not managing it with a diet or with your lifestyle or in some extreme cases with medication that's blood sugar lowering medication. A diabetic patient, for instance, needs a proper diet. We try not to be stereotypical when we're giving diet plans because everybody's different. People have different metabolisms. People have different weights. People are at different stages of this disease. So what we generally advise is that we plan meals around vegetables and fiber. So vegetables and fiber would generally reduce your blood sugar. Generally, high salt intake can be traced to high blood pressure. High blood pressure would generally stem from excessive salt intake sometimes, poor stress management, alcohol, which is also an indicator for diabetes as well. So in the case of high blood pressure, we we'll generally ask you to stay away from salt, and seasoning, seasoning cubes, the regular seasoning cubes we have in markets, and replace with herbs and spices, crayfish, iru, ginger, garlic, curry, turmeric. Those are more wholesome options for cooking. We will generally ask you to change your type of cooking methods from frying to more cooking. A lot of people do not know the importance of water in the body, and that's why a quick reminder is important. High blood pressure would generally stem from excessive salt intake sometimes, poor stress management, alcohol, which is also an indicator for diabetes as well. So in the case of high blood pressure, we'll generally ask you to stay away from salt and seasoning, seasoning cubes, the regular seasoning cubes we have in markets, and replace with herbs and spices, crayfish, iru, ginger, garlic, curry, turmeric, those are more wholesome options for cooking. We would generally ask you to change your type of cooking methods from frying to more cooking. That's boiling, um, air frying, baking, grilling. We would also ask you to eat your meals on time and then eat in small portions. And of course, water exercise. If you take care of what you eat, you take care of your health.
so far, what have we learned today? You are exactly what you eat. Eat well, live well. That's where we draw the curtain on the show today. Thank you so much for watching. If you missed any part of it, you can check it on our YouTube channel. You can also send your comments to the social media handles showing on your screen. I'll see you again next week. Stay safe. Bye for now.